I'm always uh, happy and honored to, to be with you, Ruth, and, and to celebrate your uh, new book, a picture book um, that has uh, so many possibilities and you touch upon so many important themes. And uh, it is because of the nature picture book is very brief, but it's, it's, it's condensed, but it seems that you touch a whole universe. So I would like to begin by asking you what from your two young adult novels to now, what, um, what called you to, to, write, to write a picture book and what was your engagement with this book, with the amazing uh, illustrations. So if you can just guide us about why you decided to write a picture book. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Marjorie. It's so wonderful to be in conversation with you about this book. And many, many thanks to Mala Props. Many thanks to Patricia for the introduction and Stephanie for arranging this event. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So I got interested in picture books, I think, when my son was little, my son Gabriel, and I was reading him picture books um, in English, which was a very different experience from when I was growing up as an immigrant child from Cuba growing up in New York, and I didn't really have that experience of, of picture books in English. Um, so I was very interested already many years ago. But I love the form because you, you tell a story in very few words. So it's like writing a poem. Um, you know, you, you only have 800 or maybe 900 words at most, and you want to tell a complete story. You want people to know about your characters, what they're going through, the conflict, how they're going to resolve the conflict. Um, and you want it to be beautiful and also moving at the same time. I, I think it's such a beautiful genre. And I've always loved images and pictures, and I studied photography and I made a film. So I've always loved the visual world, um, but I don't draw myself. I'm not somebody that can draw or illustrate, but I had this idea. It just came to me one day. Um, I started writing this book in 2017. So about almost five years ago, I started writing the book in September and you read <clears throat> a very, very early draft of this book and the story just like one day I literally just sat and wrote the very, very first version of the story and a lot of things came together. I always had this image of, of an aunt, uh, a tia, and that her name would be Fortuna, that she would be living on the beach, but that she would have to leave her house and find another home and that her niece, her niece would help her, um, you know, move, would help her say goodbye to her house on the beach. So somehow I had that idea. Uh, and um, and I thought I thought of it as a very, very short story. I didn't have enough to say about it that I could write 200 pages, but, but it was like a, a microcosm. It was like a little story that was going to say a lot about a community that has been displaced and had to move many, many times. And so that's how it started. It was just one of these days. I just sat and wrote that first version. And then it went through many, many, many revisions. I kept revising it for almost two years. I kept revising the story and rethinking it and um, all the details and how the days, it's one day, the whole story takes place in one day. So how that was all going to happen, I, you know, I, I had to keep revising it to, to figure it out. Um, and then eventually, fortunately, <laughs> uh, fortunately I did. So it was just something that, that I felt I, I had to do, that I wanted to do. I was very determined um, and th definitely there were a lot of obstacles. I, I think I learned how the genre of the picture book works by jumping into it and trying to write it myself and then reading a lot of picture books. Um, I think it's a genre that has really changed um, in recent years. And what's so beautiful about it is that you're writing it for the child inside yourself. And, um, and when I was writing this book, I was thinking that I didn't have a book like this when I was a child. There wasn't a book that would introduce me to the story of Sephardic Jews, of Cuban Jews. I didn't have anything like this. And I was kind of writing this book for the, the child inside myself. Beautiful. And um, I noticed that the book touches upon 
the theme that is so dear to so many people in the world, the theme of immigration, uh, the journeys from Tur uh, originally Spain, Turkey, Miami, but also it's about the relationship between Estrella and Tia Fortuna and the uh, intergenerational dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel that we, these extended families are disappearing uh, because of distance, uh, economic opportunities. But can you tell us a little bit about why you chose an aunt? Because an aunt is, is always dear she, to all of us. It's more like a, an accomplice, something you, you share since you don't share with your mother or your sister. And have you had, I think you, you said that, you've had a dia fortuna in your life, right? I do. I have an aunt. That's not exactly her name. Her name is yeah. Fanny, but yeah. um, but there is a Fortuna in the family, and it's a name I have always loved. And so yeah. I knew I was going to use the name Fortuna somehow, which means fortune. Yeah. Um, right. And and yes, I love what you said that the aunt, the auntie, can be a very very special person in a child's life. I mean, I was very close to my four grandparents, and especially my my maternal grandmother. But this aunt, who is uh, the younger sister of my father, uh, I'm very close to her. I talk to her a lot. And she was widowed fairly early. And so she's lived alone for a long time. And she lives in Miami. And then every time I'm in Miami, I visit her. That hasn't been the case now with the pandemic, but pre-pandemic. Um, and it was always very, very special. And she would make borrecas and make all of these special delicacies and i love talking to her she was um and i still do she's a very sweet version of my father which is <laughs> an interesting experience so you know she has all of the lovely cubanismos where she'll call me mi amor y mi corazón but very very naturally it's not pretentious in any way this is just how she speaks and it's that lovely you know way of speaking that 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 cubanas and cubanos have with a lot, a lot of endearments, a lot of warmth and love. And so, so she's been a special person in my life. And it did lead me to think about these intergenerational relationships that you mentioned and how much we learn from the elders, you know, whether they are grandparents, um, but also they can be an aunt or an uncle. There can be other figures in the family that can teach us a lot. And like you said, that sometimes there are things you can't say to your mother or that you don't learn from your mother because there are all these other tensions and baggage in that relationship. But sometimes with a tia, with an aunt, you can have a very, very different uh, relationship and, and they can give you so much insight on the family, on the traditions, on the stories, on you know what happened to who and why. And so she's filled me in on, on a lot of the, the stories of, of the family on my father's side. So. So I feel like she gave me a, a very feminine, I want to say, view of Sephardic culture, like seeing it from the woman's perspective, um, and that that has been something very, very special. And I think sometimes we forget about those figures when we write books, we write about the grandmother usually, um, or the grandfather, but we don't write about the aunt or the uncle, these other figures that are also important in the family. And like you say, that's really changing now because often the family is just the nuclear family and not all of these extended relatives i know you grew up with with an extended family and i did too when we came from cuba the you know the, the extended family on both sides maternal and paternal they all all um resettled in new york and so you know i i was connected to all this this all these branches of the family i also um like Tia Fortuna spirit, and she's uh, a very positive force in the world, and that's what uh, children need. So when they mm -hmm. grow up, the world will not be as harsh as it is. Not that you uh, camouflage the sorrows, but Tia Fortuna is a, a it's a, a positive force that loves loves her surrounding loves her objects, loves the sea, the palm trees, the taste of food, the burekas, and I think all her positiveness uh, makes you, or makes the, the readers understand that you don't really live 
you don't move from C way to, to uh, all, uh, assisted living, but you somehow carry all what you are and all your memories with you. Could you elaborate on that on how she, she almost um, transports herself with, with mm. grace and uh, I'm sure there's a sorrow about leaving Seaway and the place she loved, but there's a very beautiful energy about her. And I think that's at the center of the book. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah thank you, Marjorie. That's so beautifully said. I absolutely, I, I think of her as a very positive force. You know, she's very aware of, of the suffering and the sorrow but she doesn't want to impose all of that on her niece Estrella. You know, she wants her to see that, yes, she leaving the seaway is not easy. It's her little cottage on the beach. It's where she's lived since she came from Cuba. And she's fallen in love with this place, but she's also aware that things change, you know, and that you have to accept that and you have to move forward. And you're right, she has this engagement with the world. She has a very magical sense of the world. Um, you know, so she's like the, the, the palm trees, Las Palmeras, you know, she, when it's time to go, she, each one, she hugs and she says, adios, adios, adios. So she's, the world is very alive for her. And that's, that's one of the things that she's sharing with Estrella. Estrella is getting sad that she has to leave. Estrella herself likes to visit her aunt at the Seaway. And so, so she's sad too, because she's going to lose, you know, the opportunity to go there and spend time there. Um, and so, but, but um, Tia Fortuna is passing on a very valuable lesson, which is, you know, it's not mañana yet, it's still today. Let's, let's be in the present and we're still here. We can still enjoy the beach, the ocean, the sand, the birds, you know, the, the, the blue sky, you know, it's all still there. We don't have to start getting sad ahead of time. <laughs> and, um, and so that's one of the things that she's passing on um, to Estrella, but I feel like she does it in a very gentle way. It's not at all, you know, imposing, it's not at all overwhelming to the child. It's like, here's, you know, here are these things that, you, you know, you can enjoy the present, and we also have the past, you know, we have this heritage, we have this culture that's Sephardic. Um, and, and, you know, so Estrella notices that Tia Fortuna wears, like me, all of these bracelets, right? And they tinkle and they twinkle. She may not know exactly what they signify, but her Tia wears them. And, you know, when she moves her arms around, they, they make a little sound. So she notices that. The symbol of the key, the symbol of the mezuzah. All those things are there and and Estrella is kind of soaking that up, um, but again, in a way that that gives her hope for the future. And that's one of the things that that Tia Fortuna really represents. I feel to Estrella is the idea of Esperanza. That's one of the things she's passing on to to Estrella that, yes, there was sorrow, there was loss, there was having to leave a home and start another home. But through all that process, the Esperanza was always there and, and the, the need to survive and to keep going, that was always there. And so all of that was, you know, I don't know that I thought it through so consciously, but but as the character of Tia Fortuna took form, that's that's kind of who she became, this person that just has this, you know, magical sense of the world, who loves being alive, you know, who wants to pass that on to um, to her niece. Estrella, and um, even though she doesn't know, you know, how long she's going to be at the at the assisted living at the nursing home, you know, at the end when um, when Estrella says, "Oh, can I come visit you again and see the butterflies?" and she says, "Well, mashallah, God willing, yes," you know, but we don't know what's going to happen from day to day too, and so so kind of this acceptance of that as well. So so I feel like there are things in the story that an adult reading the book will, will, you know, understand that there are these other dimensions, these more philosophical dimensions. And then the child, I think, will read it from another point of view of this Tia who's so loving and, you know, passing on so many traditions and most of all, giving her hope for the future. And I noticed that um, uh, the story of, uh, of uh, 
so many ancient people of the world, especially the Jewish people, it's about departures, expulsions. Mm -hmm. We see the images of Ukraine and I, I feel they are my family because my family left with a suitcase from, from Odessa, from Kyiv. Uh, but could you share with us and uh, for the parents that are here, the children, the objects that were so important to Tia Fortuna and maybe also to you within the Sephardi context, especially the key that is, is so moving and uh, uh, just the fact that Tia Fortuna gives Estrella the key, it's a, it's a remarkable act of uh, generosity, love, and even more important, passing the tradition. So could you talk about that a little? Yeah, thank you, of course. Well, there's a legend that the Sephardic Jews, because Tia Fortuna is a Sephardic Jew, so she she stems from people who left Spain um, in 1492 or even earlier. Um, and these the word Sephardic comes from the word Sephardad, which means Spain in Hebrew. So Sephardic Jews are originally from Spain, and they're the ones who chose to leave. Um, at the time of the expulsion, which was 1492, they chose to leave Spain because their other choice was to convert to Catholicism so they could stay in their home. And Spanish Jews had existed um, there for, you know, you know, a thousand years or more. There had been communities in, in Iberia and Spain and Portugal for, for many, many centuries. And so it was really a place that they called home. And when they had to um, leave because they wanted to maintain their Jewish identity, um, you know, they took to the sea, some, you know, some went towards Portugal and Amsterdam, some went towards south, towards North Africa and Morocco, and then some went east to eventually to the Ottoman Empire or what is now Turkey. And that's where my family went. So they were all dispersed, but they held on to this idea that, that they were originally from Spain and they held on to the language, which we call Ladino or Judeo Espanol. They held on to their their Spanish, which then got mixed with all the other languages that they learned um, as they as they moved around from place to place. But the legend is that the Sephardic Jews took the key to their houses with them when they left Spain. That's the legend. Um, and so I wanted to, in some way, evoke that legend. Um, and so I decided that, you know, the key to the seaway would be a very important part of the story. And actually, the original title of the book was the key to the seaway. Um, and then, you know, we decided to change it because really, it's so much about Tia Fortuna searching for home that that seemed like the stronger way to to think about this book. But the key is very, very important. And, um, and Tia Fortuna, has brought the key to her house in Havana, which was a house she's also also had to leave at a time of revolution. So she has that key, and then she gets the key to the to the seaway. That's a building that's going to be demolished and gentrified and turned into a, a very fancy uh, residence hotel. And so she takes that key, and then um, as Estrella saying goodbye to her at the end of the story. She says, here, I have something for you and gives her the key. So the key is going to mean many things. The key references the seaway, of course, that Estrella knows. And now Estrella, even as a little child, has experienced the loss of a home. It's not her home, it's her tia's home, but it's a home that meant something to her. But she has the key, so she doesn't have the home but she has the key, so she has the memories, you know, she has the story, she has the traditions, and the key becomes this symbol that holds on to all of those things. Um, so, you know, I really, I really think it's important that that's, that's what gets passed on to her at the end. It's not just the key, but everything the key represents, you know, everything it represents in terms of um, Sephardic history and culture, but also everything it represents. You just mentioned, you know, your family, um, leaving Odessa and Kiev in an earlier generation and you know so the, how those memories um, are held on to so for this child this this may be a way that she enters into the memories of of her family and all of these immigrant stories you know that are that are part of her family history and Rose do you do you think uh, 
now that we live uh, in, in a society with greater pluralism, uh, diversity, engagement, uh, how, how do you think your book will be received, let's say, by children that perhaps don't have these memories, um, that mm -hmm. their parents and grandparents uh, never told them much? Do you think you, mm -hmm. you have thought that you will inspire them or make them think? Because I'm sure that some, you know, maybe they will remember um, a garden, a summer house, perhaps not the key, perhaps not the food, but um, my basic question is how we could engage our young readers with the past, because the past, it seems to be erased over and over again, but how do we maintain that past? And I think this is the Fortuna's uh, great lesson to, to Estrella, to maintain the past and and go with it, go with joy to, to her new place, but keep mm -hmm. who she was with her. Yeah, no, I, I love how you said all that. That's so beautiful. Yeah, I think it is it is a challenge to engage children uh, with the past right now. I think we have, we're so overwhelmed by the yeah. present in so yeah. many different yes. ways yeah. right now. Um, and there's so many problems that, that now the children that will one day be the grownups in 10 or 15 years, that they're going to have to solve so many problems, you know, climate change and nuclear weapons and war and you know, so, so many, so many issues, right? So the present can seem so overwhelming that I think to, to delve into the past the way you and I do, you know, we're, we're both so incredibly interested in the histories of our families and, you know, um, and, you know, all, all of the, all of the, um, the travels that they went through, all of the sorrows, the difficulties and, and everything that they, that they gave us, you know, um, all, all the inheritance that we have from, from our families, not just actual inheritance, but the emotional inheritance is so, um, so powerful. Um, so, yeah, so I think with children, I think all children learn traditions of some sort, you know, I mean, ours are particularly unusual, maybe and interesting, because we've got the Jewish traditions and the Latin American Latino traditions. And of course, that's not very, very common. But I feel that that kids in various ways have a mixture of backgrounds. They get maybe one, one set of traditions from the mother and one, another set of traditions perhaps from the father. So, um, so I think children can identify with the idea of like a mixture of traditions that none of us is just one thing. And, and children learn traditions in, in everyday life. You know, they, you know, they learn through food and you know what they eat you know holidays um like you said like special places if there's a summer home or a place that they go for vacations um things like that so so those are traditions and and um and children like all of us go through rites of passage you know they grow up and they you know they have birthday parties each year and you know yeah. they're all different traditions that um that we do pass on um to children so so i think children do learn about the past um, but often they don't realize it, um, that they are. And I think children learn from elders, you know, whether it's, you know, in the family or whether it's teachers or librarians. I mean, there's always elders um, around children who are teaching them traditions, passing on books to them, passing on stories to them. And, you know, children are very interested in things like medieval knights, you know, they're, they're very interested in, in stories that are either set way in the past or in the future. You know, those are things that kids tend to be very, very fascinated by. Um, so maybe it's actually isn't that hard to entice them to to learn about yeah. Yeah. Um, the past, particularly when you have a character, like you said, like Tia Fortuna, you know, who's an interesting character, kind of, you know, a, a little bit magical, a little bit odd, but but yeah. funny, you know, um, funny, alert, um, it, you know, able to make like a joke when she says, you know, I fill my borrecas with potatoes and cheese and, you know, I have the special ingredient, it's Esperanza. Yeah. And then, you know, Estrella goes, how do you fill borrecas with hope, you know? So, so she has that also that that humor that I think allows allows children to also enter into into her oh, world yeah. and what she's passing on. Beautiful. Ruth, would you like to uh, read some 
Sure, yeah. Um, because... Let me read. Read a couple of pages in English okay. and in yeah. Spanish. I think we have uh, 10 more minutes, right, Patricia? And then maybe people can join or ask questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So here's the cover um, of the book. It's quite beautiful. The artist is Devin Holtzworth, and she just did a really beautiful, beautiful job of, of, uh, of creating the art for the book. And here it is um, in Spanish. So it came out simultaneously in both languages. And one of the things I want to point out to all of you is just this beautiful, um, what's called a case wrap. So when you remove the cover, you have a suitcase, right? So the book itself is, is shaped, right? Like like a suitcase and it's Tia Fortuna's name, you know, an, an old fashioned kind of suitcase, right? Because she came over from Cuba many years ago to the United States. And then there are these end paper. So before you open the book, you have all of these beautiful symbols shown in the end papers. There's old photographs, the lucky eye bracelets that Tia Fortuna wears, um, the mezuzah that is placed um, on, on the door. Jewish families place this on the door for uh, good luck. Um, the lucky eyes, the hamsa, also the, the, the palm, um, also for good luck. The borrecas, which are these turnovers that she makes that are traditional um, in the Sephardic community and stars also. Um, so very simple. So even before you get to the book, um, you have all of these lovely symbols and here at the front is the key that we've been talking about so that symbol um, is there at the very very beginning so i'll just read to you um, just how it starts um, i love to visit my tia fortuna in her little pink casita at the seaway when my auntie was young she lived on the other side of the sea in havana from her rooftop she waved to the ships as they came into the harbor but one day, Tia had to leave with nothing but a suitcase of old photographs and the mezuzah that hung on her doorpost and a key to a home gone forever. She felt lost and wept many tears until she found her casita at the seaway. She has lived there for years and years. So here's the opening um, art. You see her waving to the ships, the port of Havana. There's her suitcase at the top and what she's packing. And here is the seaway, right? Where she finds a new home after leaving Cuba. Today is Tia's last day at the seaway. Why do you have to move, Tia? Bulldozers are coming to tear down the seaway. A fancy hotel will be built here. What will happen to your little pink casita? My home will be a memory. Tia touches the key on her necklace, like the home I left in Havana, a memory. So here she is. There's Estrella. But I want to visit you at the Seaway today and next, next Friday and always. Estrella, it's time to say goodbye and wish for Mazal Bueno. Tia gives me a hug and her lucky eye bracelets tinkle and twinkle. Mazal Bueno is good luck. Mazal means luck in Hebrew and Bueno is good in Spanish, so good luck. Come Estrella, vamos a saludar la playa. The beach wants to greet you. We kick off our sandals and breathe in the salty air. Look at that bright blue sky. The sun gives everyone its light for free. El sol, el sol, el sol. The sea roars all night, and now it's tickling our feet. El mar, el mar, el mar. This beautiful scene on the beach. And you have these words in Spanish that we kept in calligraphy. El sol, el sol, el sol, el mar, el mar, el mar. So the children also who know Spanish can enjoy those words and children who don't can, can learn those words in Spanish. Tia sinks down into the sand. What a pretty casita you're making, she says. How can Tia be happy on such a sad day? Tomorrow the sandcastle will be gone and so will we. It's not mañana yet, Estrella, let's enjoy today. 
When we get back to the seaway, Tia serves me warm borrecas. How do you make borrecas taste so delicious, Tia? I'll tell you my secret. I fill them with potatoes and cheese and esperanza. How can borrecas be filled with hope? Because they are the food of your grandfather's 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 and your grandmother's grandmother's grandmother's. They took them from Spain to Turkey to Cuba. Now we eat them here in Miami. Tia smiles. We come from people who found hope wherever they went. Esperanza, 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 I say aloud. And I help Tia pack a box with the rest of the borrecas. Here's this lovely scene here with the borrecas. And um, when Devin Holtzworth, the artist, was creating this spread, she asked me for images and symbols that she could use here to all of this to, to evoke 500 years of history and different displacements. And I think it came out so beautifully. It's like from the Borrecas, all of that is stemming out. So I'll, I'll stop there. So you'll have to read the book to, to find out more. Uh, maybe I'll just read this page, actually. Is that all you're bringing with you, I ask? I don't need much, she replies. I have so many memories in my suitcase right here. And the suitcase she points to is her head. So she's got the real suitcase, but she's also got the suitcase of her head, all the memories that she's carrying with her. And let me see, I think I have a minute left. I can show you a little bit of the Spanish. Um, so this scene here, I'll just go to the next, um, so this is the next page after the Borrecas page, I'll read this in Spanish. Llega mami y tiene prisa. Espera, dice tía, necesito mi mesusa de la buena suerte. Pero la mesusa de tía está tan cubierta de salitre que no se mueve. Finalmente tía pregunta, mesusa, ¿podrías venir conmigo? Y se suelta de pronto de la puerta. Here, so that's the, the scene with the mezuzah that she has brought with her from Cuba, but it's stuck to the door because there's so much salt there by the beach. And so the mezuzah, but once she asks the mezuzah for permission, it just pops out. Tía cierra la puerta y se mete la enorme llave de bronce en el bolsillo. Adiós, mis palmeras, adiós, susurra. Las palmeras le responden silbando, adiós, adiós, adiós. There we go. So maybe I'll stop there so we have more time to uh, talk about the book. So, uh, Patricia, shall we open it for question thoughts? Thank you, Ruth. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Maggie, thank you. I don't know if course, Patricia is there. Yeah. Uh, there are some questions. We, according to the time, we have about five minutes. Patricia should be up in just a moment, um, and I know uh, has some questions. Mm -hmm. And questions. oh, there you are. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was pushing Great. buttons, and I, I, know, I know the tech is sometimes <laughs> just doesn't go off. Right? Um, so, so while I'm uh, here, I'll just say thank you to both of you um, for the conversation and the beautiful reading, uh, Ruth, in, in English and Spanish. And then I will say goodbye. Thank you, oh, I want to thank you both for a wonderful conversation, and I'm, I'm really inspired by the idea of recovering that Sephardic tradition and trying to reach uh, young people about that tradition. And somebody I thought of was the author uh, Rosa Nissan, uh, whose book uh, Novia Catebea. Uh, is is so important in in that in that kind of that trajectory, and I wonder, Ruth, what what books inspired you, or what authors, or you know, even poet? Who how how do you engage that uh, Sephardic tradition uh, in in your own work and thought? Mm -hmm. 
Thank, well, thanks. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I have read Novia Que Te Vea, and now that you mention it, I definitely want to read it again. Um, and, and there was a movie also made, um, made based on it that's wonderful. So, um, so I've seen a lot of, of films also that have to do with, um, with Sephardic identity. There's one called El Ultimo Sephardi, The Last, the Last Sephardic Person. There's many wonderful um, films that I've seen that have been very, uh, very, very inspiring. Um, but I've also read a lot about Sephardic history. So I've, I've been reading a lot of history books um, in particular. And Marjorie has an absolutely beautiful book, um, The White Islands, um, that, is, that is a beautiful book of, of poetry inspired um, by the stories of Sephardic women. Um, so the poetry has also been uh, very, very important to me. And then listening to people's stories, since I'm also an anthropologist, so I've also done a lot of interviewing of people um, in Cuba and in Miami and in New York. Um, so listening to the stories of, um, of Sephardic Jews has also been um, an important way for me to learn. Um, and then I've also read, you know, picture books um, that don't have to do with Sephardic culture, but have to do with other cultures that I have also found um, very, very moving. Um, Matt, Matt de la Pena's Last Stop on Market Street is, is a picture book that I that I really love. Um, and that was very inspiring to me. It has, it's not, you know, it's not the same as this book in any way, but it's also an intergenerational relationship with a, a grandmother and a grandson. Um, and I, I love the way that book, um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful, stunning book. So just, you know, in the picture book, in the new picture book tradition, that's also been uh, very, very inspiring. Marjorie, do you uh, have anything that you'd like to add in terms of uh, influences on you and your work, even if they may not be related to the Sephardic tradition? Well, uh, I come from an Ashkenazi family, but uh, you know, since meeting Ruth and uh, many visits to, to Jerusalem, where I have friends that have lived in Jerusalem for nine generations, but they always say that they are from Cordoba or, or Granada first. I, I love the Sephardi world. I love its richness, its music, its cooking, its, its literature, mostly oral literature. And and the whole idea that you can preserve language through love, through memory, through conviction. So I think this Sephardim um, offer us uh, great lessons. If we use the word resilience perhaps too much, but in resilience. And also I was very moved that uh, uh, during World War II, so many Sephardim um, lost their lives to the Nazis entire Sephardic communities were wiped out. The, the Greek community also, but uh, luckily, for example, the Bulgarian community survived more uh, than the Serbian. And a lot of Ashkenazi Jews thought that the Sephardim were foreigners. They didn't speak Yiddish, they spoke Ladino. And I think it's a very important lesson, even in the Jewish world, how we have kept the Sephardim quite invisible in modern history. But thanks to the work of Ruth and so many writers, academics, and the fact that Israel recognizes Ladino as a Jewish language, I think we are closer to honoring this incredible uh, people and this incredible legacy. So I am influenced by, by the Sephardim a lot, and I listen to to, to their music all the time. Yeah. Yeah, the, the music is so beautiful. Okay. No, I'm so sorry. The music no, is so beautiful. Yeah, the, the songs, there's so much in, in those songs. It's just yeah. so much, so much experience. Yeah, loss and the search for home. It's all in that, in that, um, in that music. And it's, it's as if the, the language became the home for the Sephardim. Yes. They lost yes. their physical geographical home, but it's in language and, and in the songs that that's, that's where they found home as they moved from place to place. One of the, uh, at the synagogue where uh, we attend uh, in uh, Asheville, Beth HaTefila, 
we have we do have um, cifredine there, and we really have been trying to do a lot more culturally to recognize that experience, but also the conversos. Uh, where there's that lost, there's that part that we're talking about resilience, but resistance, the, the, and then the attempt to survive under the, the most extreme and difficult circumstances uh, in Spain and Portugal and other parts of Europe uh, during a period of great repression and violence. I think the, the the story of the conversos is also connected with that. And I wonder, Ruth, as you were, as you work through your history, your own history, but then your work as an anthropologist as well, what do you think of that tension of conversion versus um, resistance? Yeah, it's so it's so powerful. I'm, I'm actually working now on, a, on another middle grade novel. Um, and this topic is, is part of it. Um, I'm very interested in, in the conversos and their story. And really, we're all part of the same Sephardic story. Like, you know, some chose to leave or were able to leave. Others couldn't and stayed behind. And they became the conversos. And both suffered in different ways and both held on to the identity in different ways, because we hear of conversos who, you know, who didn't always know generations later why they were doing things, but dressing in white on Friday night or lighting candles or not eating pork, you know, maintaining these traditions that were Jewish that they didn't even always know why, but but an ancestor had maintained them and they were, you know, passed on. And and I find that so incredibly moving, you know, that um, that this identity got passed on secretly, that they were hidden. Jews, um, you know, and, and now there's, there's, um, you know, a lot of new historical work that's uncovering what, you know, what, um, what happened to the conversos in Cuba and elsewhere, their historians, you know, working, working on this topic. And we've heard of many converso families um, in New Mexico and the United States and, and, um, and elsewhere. And so it's, so I find it very, very powerful. And I think the two stories connect and often in the same family, you had people where you know some chose to convert and some chose to leave, and families were divided. You know the way families are divided today about politics. You know that that was another kind of politics then in the 15th century and before, and so families were divided, and some left and some stayed. and And I and I address that in in this new novel that I'm working on now uh, for middle grade readers because I'm I'm very very fascinated by that. And um, and there are many people of converso background. Um, that are researching um, these stories now and doing the historical work and going to the archives and you know and finding you know their their families for for generations being conversos in one particular village in one particular town in Spain or Portugal. And Spain and Portugal undertook a very interesting approach to redressing or uh, trying to reconcile with the expulsions by offering a, a citizenship option. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that I'm, I wonder if that also spurred on, at least in our family it did, more research and investigation and historical work to try to find out what was it, what was it going to take? Or what, did you, what do you think of, of those attempts at the, at the governmental or state level? Yeah, no, I found that all very fascinating. I was following it very, very closely, um, the law of return, as it's called, and making it possible for people of Sephardic ancestry to, to seek Spanish citizenship or Portuguese citizenship um, as well. And I find that incredibly fascinating. What's interesting is that Spain um, is no longer offering this citizenship, they they had a deadline. <laughs> they had a deadline for the offer, and so um, so it's no longer possible. But Portugal has no deadline, so they they still are offering it if you can prove your Sephardic ancestry. And there's you know a whole set of of rules to do that. Um, you can you can seek uh, you know Portuguese citizenship at this point, which is EU citizenship and and i know several people several friends of mine that have um have gone through the whole process and um the ones i know actually most of the ones i know have gotten spanish citizenship were able to do it before the deadline but then i also know people 
that have chosen to do the Portuguese route, which is a little easier because with the Portuguese route, you don't actually have to go to Portugal and sign papers in person before a notary, but in Spain, they required you to go, go to Spain and sign papers before a notary um, as part of the process, which was essentially impossible during the pandemic. Um, so, but I think it's so interesting that the contemporary governments of these two countries have sought out Sephardic Jews and that for many, it was a very important sentimental um, decision to, to seek again, to be part of these nations where, where their families came from. Um, so many of the people that I know, it was very much a sentimental decision to, to seek that citizenship, to seek that passport and be able to go to Spain as, as a Spaniard. I hope that there'll be a lot written about that as a uh, as an experience as a part of the larger Jewish experience that that transcends centuries. It's it's truly an amazing turnabout. When when you think about Ruth, uh, this book and its immediate translation into Spanish, uh, what? What do you think about maybe differences and similarities in, in these books? I mean, certainly there's no way that any translation is a carbon copy of the other. When you, when you en engage your, your book in two different languages, what's your experience of them, similarities and differences? Well, you know, I, I wrote it in English. Um, myself because I do write mostly in English. So I, I do write some poetry in Spanish first, but I mostly write um, in English. And I was very happy when uh, the translator brought it to life in Spanish. And she herself is also Cuban and Sephardic. So, so that was very interesting, you know, finding somebody who had such a similar background to me to translate it um, felt very good. And, um, and I got to um, look at the translation before it was published and I did make some adjustments and some of them were just personal poetic adjustments. There was nothing wrong with the original version, but there were just things that I envisioned differently and, and the translator was very open to that. So I did make a few, a few changes, minor ones, but just things that were important um, to me. So I did participate um, in, in that process and I read it aloud. To myself in Spanish, it was just really beautiful to to hear it in Spanish because I was imagining that the story in Tia Fortuna's head it would be told in Spanish and Estrella's head it would be told in English so that they're, they're you know they're <laughs> the two the two generations um, come together but they also have differences because Estrella is an American child and Tia Fortuna is an a Cuban Sephardic immigrant so. Um, so I thought of that as as kind of the two languages kind of allowing, you know, each character in a sense to to tell the story in the language that's more natural um, to each of them. So um, so I love that. And, and being bilingual myself, you know, I, I love that I can go between the two stories. And um, there's a, a teacher who has been posting pictures that her uh, drawings that her students have been making. They've been reading it in an, in an English as a second language class. They've been reading the book and, um, and they've been making these really beautiful illustrations inspired by the book. Um, so I think it's a book that, you know, because it's in the two languages, it'll be very helpful for ESL students, you know, to be able to read it in Spanish and then, you know, read it in English and, and learn English that way by going back and forth between the two versions. Marjorie, what, what about your translation experience or moving between the two worlds of a language or maybe more than one, maybe more than two? What, what, there, there's, a, there's, of course, a lot of linguistic uh, research and epistemological discussion about that and political discussion. Where, where do you weigh in on that? Um, when I arrived to the U.S. at age 15, I had no knowledge of of English. Uh, I studied very little English at school, but I, I was fluent in Hebrew and, and of course, Spanish. And my, um, I was um, very aware, although I couldn't articulate how aware I was, that, my, that our living in Chile, at least for me, much more than my siblings, was very traumatic. It was a profound loss. And I knew that the only way I would 
mend or recover what I lost was through language. And this is what so many poets and writers do. So I decided to always write in Spanish. I, I feel very comfortable um, in the English language um, uh, to write essays, uh, not to write novels or to teach. And I feel I have a, a, a fluent vocabulary because when people learn a language, they really study it even more than, than native speakers. But um, although English is a very beautiful language, it, it doesn't speak to me the way Spanish does. It doesn't speak to me intimately. Mm -hmm. And poetry is a very intimate uh, relationship with language. So I ch choose to, um, to write in Spanish, but I've come to believe that every single language is extraordinary, is important. Uh, you can read a, a Portuguese poet, Fernando Pessoa in German translation. You can read Garcia Lorca in Russian. So I, I am all for the um, sisterhood and brotherhood of languages that allow us to, to understand the soul of, of a nation. But as far as I am uh, concerned, um, I, I am perfectly uh, comfortable writing in Spanish and uh, readers will either find me in translation or will find me in the original language, but, but I think a poet should follow what, what our hearts ask us to do. Uh, and many writers of my generation chose um, to write in English, like Sandra Cisnero, Julia Alvarez. And I think that was their choice and it was an important choice for them. But I never asked myself if I had a choice. I somehow knew I had no choice, that this, this was going to be my path. Ruth, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, that's so powerful, Marjorie. I'm glad you shared that. And it's one of the things I've always admired about your work that you chose, you made that decision to write in Spanish. And so you always, your work is always translated into English. So it's always in, in, in another language, right? Um, this language that you use publicly for teaching, for lecturing, for writing essays, but but the language of the heart for you is Spanish and will always be Spanish. And so you, you write from that language and so your place in in latina literature is is different because as you just mentioned various you know latina writers sandra cisneros esmeralda santiago um, julia alvarez etc who are all wonderful writers but they all they all chose to write in english um, and i think that's really interesting sometimes they evoke spanish or they incorporate spanish into their work, but writing exclusively in Spanish is not, not something they do, it's something that, that you do. And I think it's so beautiful. I think it's it's such a powerful thing to, to choose English as your translated language, yeah. but to hold on to Spanish and to write Spanish as a woman who is Jewish, I think is also very interesting. And in that sense, you are very Sephardic, even though your family is Ashkenazi, you are very Sephardic because you, you know, your home is in the Spanish language. You, you, you know, your family was forced to flee Chile, just like, you know, all, more than a million refugees are fleeing Ukraine right now. And, but, but it's, it's kind of your assertion that yes, I may have lost that home, but the language is still where I live. And I think that's very, very powerful. Thank you, Ruth. Ruth, I was uh, hoping that you might give us a little teaser in these last few minutes, maybe about the this book you're writing, uh, Why Middle Grade and Why This Book Now? <laughs> well, um, it's, it's a book that I'm very excited about. I'm finding it very difficult. It's a little ambitious. Uh, Marjorie has already read a very early draft and it's gotten a little better since you read it, Marjorie. Um, and it takes place in four um, historical periods and it's four different characters whose stories connect um, at the end. Um, among, among the books that inspired it are Refugee by Alan Gratz, um, which is a book that I love. And I love the idea of different characters, you know, seeming their stories seem so different. How are they ever going to converge? And I, I love that, that structure. 
first story. So, so it has some similarities uh, to, to Alan's Refugee. Um, and this is four, four girls in four different time periods. They're all 11 years old. And one story takes place in Spain in 1492, and it's during the time of the expulsion. And then another story takes place in Turkey in the 1920s. And, um, and this character, um, she is being forced to leave Turkey because um, she has acted, according to her father, inappropriately and dishonored the family. And so he's shipping her off to Cuba. And that's a little bit inspired by my paternal grandmother's story. Um, she went off to Cuba all by herself and never saw her parents again. And, you know, we don't know that much about why that happened to her. And so this is kind of my fictional um, imagining of, of that story. And then uh, there's another story in um, 1961, um, a, a Cuban character, and she's um, participating in the literacy campaign in Cuba at that time. And then the last character in the early 2000s, um, she is growing up in Miami. And so she is absorbing all this history that is kind of going to, to Marjorie's question about how do we pass on all this history to young people? How much, how much do they want to know about this history? And she's, she's kind of dealing with that, the, the, the character, the most contemporary character. And then at the end of the story, she and her family go to Spain and the story kind of comes full circle, um, or hope I hope it does <laughs> in, in the way I've written it. So, so yeah, so there's now, I guess, uh, like a third draft that I'm working on and it's with my editor and um, hoping now to spend the rest of this month working really uh, closely on it. And if all goes well, it should be out in fall of 23. So, so exciting. <laughs> So excited! That's wonderful news. Breaking news! Breaking news! Breaking news! news. <laughs> right, right here in our wonderful author event with another fantastic conversation between Ruth Behar and Marjorie Agosin. We're here to celebrate and learn so much about this this great book that is picture book that you've written, Ruth. And I'll say the title in Spanish and English, in Spanish, El Nuevo Hogar de Tio Fortuna en Historia Judía Cubana. And then, of course, in English, Tia Fortuna's New Home. It's been a pleasure to listen to you both, to learn from you. Thank you for sharing your work. And we look forward to this next Dynamic Duos get together because we want to hear more from you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Congratulations. Thank you, Marjorie, for your uh, wonderful uh, contribution to this conversation. It's, it's made better. It's the, it's the dialectic, right? We, we, we brought you together and you've made the third thing even better. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Patricia. Your questions were amazing. Also, thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. And thank you, Marjorie. This was Lovely. Thank you, Malaprops. I'm really, really delighted. Thank you so much.